Okay, um, good afternoon, uh, everyone, and welcome to this afternoon's uh, debate on what is liberalism. Um, first of all, thanks to the Open Society Initiative for Europe and Time to Talk, who are supporting this debate as part of their Understanding the Populist Turn, the X Debate series, which is a series of uh, debates and uh, interviews and discussions with uh, political figures who have changed their minds on issues um, and to try and understand their, their reasons for doing that. Um, and I think it feels kind of more important than ever um, to have this a, a conversation uh, on a European level, um, very much that, you know, that liberalism is, you know, is, is viewed as having its kind of spiritual home in Europe. Right? Um, and in this sort of period of time, uh, it's important than ever to think about what shared European values are irrespective uh, of membership or not of the European Union. Uh, also to say that we've been live streamed uh, at the moment. So hello to all of the uh, Twitter trolls uh, out there. I'm glad you could join us. Um, I won't be able to hear you, but I do hope you enjoy listening to the debate. Uh, my name is David Bowden. I'm an associate an associate fellow of the Institute of Ideas and one of the organizers um, of the festival. Um, the title of this session is fairly explanatory. It's, it's part of a strand of debates where we've been looking at uh, the changing nature of political language. Uh, there was a session on democracy earlier and the kind of the notion of political language. And I thought it would be useful to try to um, understand what it is we mean when we talk about liberalism today. Um, it's, you know, th it was a political ideology which seemed um, triumphant globally um, from the end of the Cold War until, um, uh, until the past year, really, even thinking back to last year's Battle of Ideas, uh, you know, it was assumed that Brexit seemed like a, it was a strange kind of glitch, a very specific to Britain. Um, and then, of course, there would be the, the, you know, the Clinton era uh, in the US with a, a liberal Supreme Court, um, that there would be, uh, you, know, a, a, you know, quite probably a, you know, a sort of centrist uh, sort of French government and a sort of straightforward uh, uh, passage of elections. And although while, um, you know, obviously, they, uh, liberalism isn't dead yet, there is obviously a lot of uncertainty um, around its future direction uh, with the rise of populist and explicitly um, anti-liberal movements um, across Western and Eastern Europe, as well as in the US. And particularly we've seen in the UK an election fought between parties uh, who are um, often, it seemed, at war with their own liberal wings and with a kind of, sort of almost you know, remarkable hostility to uh, the idea of kind of, sort of free market orthodoxy, um, which had held until recently. So I thought it would be a timely moment to look at what liberalism is. Um, I'm somebody who generally hesitates to call myself a liberal as a, as, as a term, but I just consider myself somebody who works you know, a, a, and sort of thinks very much in the tradition of liberal values, and I hold liberal values to be very important. So it might help me to perhaps understand why I uh, have a nervousness about ascribing myself as, as a liberal. Um, there's increasingly attacks on liberals and kind of liberal hypocrisy um, from the uh, US administration uh, at the moment, and a, a number of figures uh, in the far left and on the right. And that troubles me sometimes because um, although I also uh, can attack liberal hypocrisy, I also worry that sometimes the, the reasons why they're being criticised are not necessarily the re uh, as liberals, is not the reasons I would criticise them for. So I've kind of put together a sort of panel a, um, who I think, you know, all of whom to some degree would describe themselves at least in a kind of liberal traditional view themselves as part of that, but with very different perspectives um, and perhaps criticisms of that and to try and just give us a sort of overview about what they think um, that the term means um, and what the position is and what the future is for us. To introduce them very briefly, um, speaking first to my uh, immediate right we have Dr James Panton who is head of Upper Sixth and Politics at Magdalen College School, Oxford, having previously lectured in political theory and philosophy at the university. He's a uh, co-founder of the Civil Liberties campaign group The Manifesto Club and a regular broadcaster and writer on political and ethical issues. You may have heard him uh, on the Moral Maze where he's an occasional panelist. Uh, next to my immediate left, although he doesn't often get described as that politically, uh, Nick Gillespie, who's the editor-in-chief of Reason Magazine and Reason TV, uh, which is the leading voice of liber libertarianism uh, in the world, um, really. And I, I always think is, I'm delighted to have Nick here because I, I always find Reason a kind of essential uh, reading for of difficult liberal issues. I don't always agree with uh, everything that it says, but it actually really um, you know, always will have a fresh and very interesting take that it makes me 
think and engage quite you know, uh, closely with him. So it's great to have him on the panel. Um, he's also a highly experienced journalist, a two-time finalist of the National Magazine Awards. Uh, and he says that he's probably the only journalist to have interviewed Ozzy Osbourne and Slash, as well as Milton Friedman. Uh, you can add me to the list, maybe. Uh, to my, uh, 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 the uh, furthest away from me, on, my, on the right, we have Dr. Lucas Pavlovsky, who is managing editor and columnist for Kultura Librana, uh, Liberal Culture in Polish. Uh, it's the leading Polish monthly liberal magazine. Um, he has taught and studied in Indiana and Oxford, and he has won a National Bank of Poland award for his interview with Michael Sandel on economics. And then to my uh, far left, we have Rowena Davis, who's a secondary school teacher in Croydon, um, as well as a writer for publications such as The Economist, Guardian, Times, and The Sun. Uh, she's been a Labour parliamentary candidate in the past. Um, she's also the author of the book Tangled Up in Blue, Blue Labour and the Struggle for uh, Labour's Soul, which you know, was looking at questions of Labour's own uh, liberal move and where that placed it in terms of its kind of you know, communitarian uh, uh, history and a sort of social democratic history. So um, great to have uh, all of you on the panel. Uh, we're going to ask you to speak for initial five to seven minutes. I'll give you a yellow card to just sort of indicate the minute sort of remaining to try and wrap up your remarks and I'll try and make sure we have plenty of time for audience questions. So without much further ado, James. Okay, thanks David. Um, one reason why I think answering the question of what liberalism is is uh, difficult is because, like any ideological tradition, the content of liberalism has evolved and developed uh, over time through political conflict and historical change. So at different historical junctures, liberals have been uh, more or less for and against the state. They've been uh, more or less pro and anti-democracy. Uh, and, and they've quite likely been on both the right at some times and on the wrong side uh, of lots of different political debates and arguments. The, the historical character of liberalism therefore means that I think insofar as there is a crisis of liberalism now, we have to understand that as, as a crisis of the present. And, and I guess what I want to do is I want to go back to um, some of, certainly not all of, but some of what I would take to be core liberal notions uh, that develop historically, what I might call the ethical core of liberalism, um, to look at the way in which I think these are ideas and values which are uh, increasingly uh, under attack, but I think also undermined because I think the attack is not always uh, uh, explicit. Um, so if one thinks about the liberalism that emerges from quite a long period of social transformation um, three and a half centuries ago, it's a radical and, and obviously at times revolutionary uh, movement. In opposition to uh, social hierarchy and privilege, diverse thinkers such as Hobbes and Locke and Montesquieu and Tom Paine and uh, Smith and Kant, uh, and ultimately in the, in, in the culmination of of, of liberalism in, in the English tradition, John Stuart Mill, they develop different ideas that build a model of the individual and a model of society. And these ideas, I think, prioritize the notion of individual rights and freedoms as fundamental to social organization. They prioritize a model of humanity that is universal and egalitarian uh, in a quite important way. Um, they uh, create uh, and demand a suspicion of uh, unjustified power, not least the power of the state, uh, and a demand that power and authority should be uh, both uh, subject to uh, justification and continuously held uh, to account. And of course, they, they prioritize reason. We have reason over here, uh, but I'll try and be rational too. They prioritize reason uh, over superstition and prejudice in the organization of our social lives. So to give a couple of examples, when Thomas Jefferson claims in the Declaration of Independence, famously, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that amongst these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. He's making a claim to the universal equality uh, of human beings, uh, to a universal humanity who are equal in their capacity for freedom. Now, of course, the society that, uh, uh, that Jefferson lived in uh, uh, didn't uh, reflect that fundamental insight uh, that he had about the nature of human uh, equality in its practical or social organization. But what Jefferson's uh, statement, therefore, does is to establish a claim, uh, a criteria uh, that we uh, still uh, uh, I think uh, need to struggle quite hard to try and bring about and to live up to. When Immanuel Kant in his second formulation of the categorical imperative says always treat humanity whether in your own person or that of another always at the same time as an end and never simply as a means. What he's doing is to develop further this uh, ethical universalism uh, in terms of um, a rational foundation for recognizing uh, other individuals as like me 
like me, free, uh, capable of autonomy, capable of rational thought, capable of self-development, and as individuals who have their own purposes in life, purposes which, as a rational being who, who shares a common humanity with them, I ought to respect out of a respect for my own uh, rationality and my own uh, humanity. What the, the, these core ideas start to do is to build a model of what it is to be a, a human being at this particular historical juncture, a creature capable of rational thought, with potential autonomy, with the capacity for self-development, a bearer of rights, and someone who shares in this universal human condition and human experience. And I think these are, are the ethical core uh, features of liberalism which are increasingly uh, undermined and maligned uh, and under attack in different ways. So let me just work through, through one of them, which, which, which I think is an interesting line of development to, to try and show you what I mean. The idea that individuals are capable of reason and thus capable of rationally making sense of the world uh, around them and then choosing their course of action uh, in the world poses a very radical challenge to authoritarian and paternalistic states. And just as much, it poses a challenge to each and every one of us as rational beings to work out what we think is right and to try to live accordingly. The implication of this belief in reason is a demand on the one hand for individual freedom in order to work out the kind of life that I want to lead and, and to work through the values that I think are right to live by. I, I have to live freely, I have to live free from uh, coercion uh, and to have the maximum amount of freedom that I can. On the other hand, it demands that I am tolerant of the decisions uh, and the lifestyles and the beliefs that other people hold and that other people ascribe to. I think with that idea of tolerance, you can see the way in which one fundamental aspect of this, this, this kind of ethical liberal core is, is undermined, because for all the talk that we have of tolerance in contemporary society, I, I think we are profoundly uh, intolerant. You only have to log on to social media or indeed check the Twitter feed that I imagine is, 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 is expanding now as I talk and as we go on talking um, to, 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 to kind of uh, discover that intolerance. But what I think is, 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 is a challenge in the uh, intolerance an intolerance of differences of opinion, an intolerance of people who disagree with you and with your values fundamentally. I think what is being challenged there is a, 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 a really important uh, a underpinning notion that individuals share a common humanity, that they share a, a condition uh, uh, in common, which is a capacity to work through arguments and to work through ideas and to come to some kind of uh, common uh, uh, agreements and decisions. Um, we often mistake, I think, tolerance for uh, uh, indifference. I, I think much of what passes for tolerance at the moment is, is a peculiar form of indifference. So I pretend that my uh, indifference about who you choose to have sex with and how you choose to do it is tolerance. But in fact, what I mean is I don't care. Uh, I'm just not interested in your sex life. I think what is uh, of moment, you can tell us about it if you like, but uh, I, I think what is of moment, it might be interesting. What, what is of moment in this is, is that actually tolerance only kicks in when, when what you do and what you stand for is, is something that I find abhorrent, something that I find uh, uh, horrendous, something that I find challenges uh, uh, my uh, values and my ideas to their very core. And so in, in, in expressing tolerance, it's very different to expressing indifference. Tolerance actually hurts, it's painful. It's something that I have to work on uh, and achieve. I think the flip side of that, in saying that tolerance is not about indifference, is that it also involves uh, a willingness amongst those of us who tolerate each other's profound differences to actually think that it might be important enough to work through those differences and to argue about them. So again, I don't think tolerance means that I, I, I recognise and respect what you think. I, I recognise and respect you as someone capable of thinking. But I actually take the ideas and the values and the principles which are at stake seriously enough to think that your ideas are worthy of criticism and challenge and robust debate. So I think just the final point I would say is that that implies a certain notion of what we are as individuals as, as not just people who are rational, people who are capable of making rational decisions or capable of living freely, but actually individuals who are robust enough to be, to be capable of engaging in those kinds of rational exchanges about what is important in life. And I think in, in following the theme that's been going on in this room all day, you can see a number of areas which I'm sure we'll talk about of the way in which that <coughs> fundamental belief of, of robust individuals who share a universal or common experience as human beings is increasingly uh, uh, maligned, I would say, and challenged. Okay, thank you, Jim. Nick. Okay. And uh, Jim had promised me last night when we slept together that he would tell everyone that he was my boyfriend now. So that's, I was shocked by, by the uh, sex life comment. But uh, thank you very much. And uh, actually uh, what he 
said would have saved me about eight years of undergraduate education. I think that was uh, about the best uh, concise summary of, of liberal political theory uh, that I've heard. And let me build on that a bit, which, and first by uh, recognizing, you know, we, we need to recognize that we are in a crisis, I think, of political authority, uh, certainly in the United States, which is really the only country I know semi-well. Um, I think it's clear in Britain as well, and, and actually throughout Western Europe and probably most of the OECD or developed world, um, where, uh, you know, for the past couple of centuries or, you know, since 1800, since whenever you want to kind of define the beginning of a kind of modern nation state, or of a liberal political order going back to the early modern period. There's a crisis brought on by, uh, largely by political and public sector actors, uh, elected officials, police, teachers, regulators, et cetera. In the United States, at least over the past 50 to 60 years, almost every large um, kind of public, uh, public sector institution or set of actors, such as school teachers, such as the police, such as the courts, are at the lowest level of uh, support or of confidence that we've seen. That's also matched in many public, uh, private sector uh, charities, the Catholic Church, a variety of other large uh, non-state institutions that are another, nonetheless very important to society, civil society institutions, which have come down. The places where you don't see that, uh, interestingly, and I'll get to this in a second, uh, oftentimes are uh, uh, new economy kind of uh, uh, groups, such as uh, ride-sharing apps like Uber or Lyft, uh, Airbnb, this is where you're seeing a flourishing of confidence and trust. Uh, because the way those systems are built, they actually prize transparency and uh, easy, uh, easy transactions that are based on mutually reinforcing reputation. But in any case, what, what I would like to argue uh, in, in this uh, uh, forum is that uh, American uh, libertarianism is, is essentially 21st century liberalism, and, and I mean that in the best sense, in that what libertarianism takes from the historic uh, kind of understanding of liberalism, of classical liberalism, and even to a certain degree a kind of contemporary liberalism of an expanded welfare state, is that it stresses equality before the law, uh, it strives for equality of opportunity, and it believes in pluralism and tolerance, uh, and a robust public sphere of public debate uh, about how, what, are, what are the best ways to live. Um, and not to use coercion, but to use moral suasion and example in order to get to a place where more people are able to become uh, their kind of maximal self. Um, so what, what does American libertarianism mean? Uh, it's often confused, and this happens in the United States a lot, uh, it gets confused with anarchism, which I think is a real uh, problem and a misnomer. Uh, but it, uh, libertarianism calls not for no government, but for uh, clearly limited government and uh, especially effective government policies that should be geared towards maximizing autonomy of individuals. And, and uh, where we have um, kind of fallen apart is that we, we no longer do that. We have a uh, government of massive overlapping programs that all condition any kind of aid or any kind of development of individuals in a way that gets very confusing, um, as opposed to, uh, for instance, pushing for, uh, in terms of cash uh, transfers of uh, benefits to people, whether it's uh, K through 12 education or welfare or anything like that, or even health care, uh, instead of giving people unrestricted cash payments, uh, we give people vouchers for this type of housing or this type of education, or we don't give them that at all, but we force them to go to a particular place. Um, what, what U.S. Uh, contemporary uh, libertarianism does also is it rejects uh, the debt-financed welfare and warfare state. I, do people in England use the phrase welfare and warfare state? It was popular uh, in the late 60s, um, uh, basically, to attack what Lyndon Johnson called the Great Society, uh, which meant maximizing uh, American presence around the globe in places like Vietnam and a military buildup as well as really maximizing the social welfare state, which I think most libertarians and most liberals would recognize as more a means of social control uh, rather than social uplift. But we reject the debt finance welfare and warfare state that ultimately suppresses economic growth and innovation through uh, claims on future uh, incomes of people even not yet born through taxes or inflation, uh, and then stifles all sorts of uh, lifestyle as well as commercial innovation through ever thicker and thicker uh, uh, layers of, of regulation on business. 
And then finally, uh, what uh, contemporary libertarianism does, and this I think it pulls most clearly from a kind of classical liberal tradition and kind of in the ways that uh, Jim was talking about, it empowers individuals and groups uh, to create what um, um, a, uh, one philosopher has called a utopia of utopias. Uh, rather, um, what, it, what it does, instead of being prescriptive where there is one model that is considered uh, the uh, the best way to do things, and then people kind of get regimented or straightjacketed into that. Rather, by limiting the state and the scope of the state to control various aspects of our lives, of our political lives, of our commercial lives, of our economic lives, of our personal lives, it allows people to experiment or to run what John Stuart Mill called uh, experiments in living. Um, which we can learn from. Uh, and I, I like uh, Jim's stress on the idea of arguing about different models or different experiments in living, uh, not simply noting them and then turning away or building a higher fence. Um, from Uber and Airbnb and Whole Foods in, uh, in business, uh, libertarianism celebrates and, and, uh, and enables an ability to try things differently and see whether or not they flourish on how well they serve or don't serve customers, real and potential. In a cultural uh, context, this allows us to create and produce culture on uh, the terms that we want to set um, and design uh, uh, away from state censorship or state restrictions. Uh, it, it currently uh, streaming services and, and production houses uh, for TV and movies such as HBO, Netflix, Amazon, YouTube allow for massive uh, proliferation of all sorts of voices, all sorts of forms, and you can either watch them or not, and you can learn from them or not, and hybridize from them or not. And then finally, in the lifestyle space, what libertarianism champions are people being able to, uh, either as individuals or as groups, to create communities, intentional communities, partial communities, total uh, totalist communities even, uh, that they might want to try to see if uh, you know they can create what uh, I guess it was William Bradford called the shining city on the hill. Uh, he was wrong about that, the, of, uh, of uh, uh, colonial uh, Boston and Massachusetts. Uh, there's places like the Free State Project as one example of this in New Hampshire, which is a bunch of libertarians who decided to move 20,000 of them to a small state and then affect the political uh, structure of that state and move it towards a more limited government libertarian perspective. Uh, so that's my pitch for liberalism uh, in the 21st century is properly understood as libertarianism. Yeah, thank you. Okay, Lucas. Um, well, um, can I take the mic? Yeah, thank you. So, um, you know, back in the communist times in, in Poland, the system, the, the political system in Poland was called in communist uh, newspeak people's democracy. So there was a joke back in the day, what is the difference between democracy and people's democracy? And uh, the answer roughly the same as between a chair and an electric chair. Uh, so I think, I, I think that the same applies to the difference between liberal and illiberal democracy. Uh, because the term illiberal, illiberal democracy is, is getting more and more popular and it was first popularized by Farid Zakaria in his foreign affairs piece, The Rise of Illiberal Democracy. Uh, he wrote that from Peru to Palestinian Authority, from Sierra Leone to Slovakia, we see the rise of disturbing phenomenon, illiberal democracy. And Zakaria's piece made a very, to my mind, very important distinction between democracy and liberalism. Democracy, in this view, and I think that's, that's, that's a proper view, is a mechanism of electing political leaders. That's the way you get your authority. You just go and elect them. Uh, but uh, to say that the state is democratic doesn't say very much about how it is actually run. It just says how you get your politicians, how you get your authorities elected. So then the, the, the liberal component kicks in. And liberal, by contrast, is about the norms, practices uh, that shape political life. James talk, uh, talked about it uh, quite a lot. So a liberal state is one in which individual rights are protected by the rule of law. Uh, it protects, this, this kind of state protects the, the individual, not only against uh, the abuses of, uh, of a tyrant, but also against the abuses of democratic majorities, because democracy can also be very illiberal. Um, 
As a Bulgarian political scientist, you might know Ivan Krastev once told me, liberal democracy is a system in which you never actually win, because when you win elections, there are limits to what you can actually do. But you also never actually lose, because even if you lose the elections, you're on the losing side. There are, you know, buffers that will protect you. Uh, so, you might think of liberal democracy as democracy with airbags, right? According to Zakaria, these two components, liberalism and democracy, uh, are getting are becoming more and more uh, disengaged from one another, and he saw that as a, as a real threat. Now, let's jump 17 years into the future. It's the year 2014, and we are not in the United States, but in Romania. And in Romania, we are joined by uh, Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban, who just gave a speech, on, a famous speech on illiberal democracy, in which he not only said that uh, illiberal democracy is not a threat, he said that that is actually the kind of state he wants to build in Hungary. Uh, and what he said, what is happening today in Hungary can be interpreted as an attempt of the respective political leadership to harmonize relationship between the interest, uh, of indiv interests of individuals and achievements of the country, the nation. Meaning that the Hungarian nation is not as simple as some of individuals, but a community that needs to be organized, strengthened and developed. And in this sense, the new state that we are building is an illiberal state, a non-liberal state. So you see, look what he's doing here. He's saying that respecting individual rights and goals uh, makes it difficult or maybe even impossible to advance national interests. Furthermore, uh, furthermore what he says, when those two collide, uh, individual interests and national interests, uh, the national interests take precedence, right, should prevail. And now, you need to ask yourself a question. Who defines national interests? And obviously, national interests are, uh, usually are defined by the parliamentary majority, in this case, Mr. Orban and his party. Thus, uh, what I would like to say, without a healthy liberal component, democracy can easily turn into t tyranny of uh, what Detak Bill called a tyranny of uh, majority, or rather, given that the ruling parties hardly ever get the actual majority of the votes, it's the tyranny of the best organized minority. Uh, so, without, uh, without this liberal component that we have in our uh, democracies, uh, we can easily lose what we take uh, for, for granted. Uh, political freedoms, individual rights, rule of law, uh, kind of predict predictability of, of, of the state, so when somebody tells you, and there are many people apart from Orban uh, doing so, because uh, let me just point out to one fact that everybody now is a Democrat. Vladimir Putin, perfectly uh, democratic. That's what he says about himself. Uh, Orban, uh, Erdogan, they never say they are undemocratic, they, but quite often they say they, they are just different kind of Democrats, illiberal Democrats. Uh, they just don't want the liberal part of democracy. What I'm trying to say is that there is no d democracy without this liberal part, or at least it cannot last very long. But then you can ask, does it have to be this way? Does it, uh, does it always has to be the, uh, have to be this way, that democracy without liberalism must turn into some form of authoritarianism? And let me get back to this uh, joke I said at the beginning uh, about the electric chair. Well, you can sit on an electric chair and maybe be, even be quite comfortable on, on it. But the problem is, you never really know when somebody flicks the switch off. Thank you. <laughs>
I feel like, I'm not sure if the rest of you do, uh, a massive beneficiary of liberalism, not least after speak, listening to you speak, Lucas, and your perspective also from Eastern Europe. But growing up um, in North London, going to a comprehensive school where 55 languages were spoken in the playground, a lot of the time my school felt like a mini United Nations and I was able to benefit from all of these different perspectives. Uh, and then growing up after that and um, being a journalist and being able to write in a place that had freedom of the press is just remarkable. And the fact that I was then after that able to be a woman in politics uh, might not have been possible without that liberal tradition. So I really want to premise my remarks today uh, with a huge appreciation for those values and all that it has brought me and all that it has brought us. But the central argument I want to make is ultimately one slightly of a criticism. And that is that I believe that in our society today, liberalism has got out of balance with love. Uh, what do I mean by that? Well, liberalism is a place where we have space and we have freedoms and we have rights and uh, we have a huge space to develop ourselves as, as individuals. But by love, I mean perhaps communitarianism, something that pulls us closer together, while liberalism sometimes makes us feel further apart. I mean something about community, about responsibility, about loyalty, about our identity. I'm talking about our emotional connections to each other uh, beyond um, our sense of individual atomized agents. And I think that part of Trump and Brexit and this these moves towards illiberalism is a reaction to liberalism without love in our society. And the challenge for the modern left, uh, certainly as I see it for Labour, is to be able to embrace love as much as it has done liberty. Um, so um, working as a parliamentary candidate in Southampton Itchin, uh, for those of you who don't know it, it's a white working class uh, part of the south of England. Um, we fought for four years there to win, and we lost. And we lost largely because uh, people, I believe, had lost hope in liberalism. And for a lot of those people there, particularly white working class people, um, they didn't feel that liberals could do patriotism, for example. Uh, and for a lot of my liberal friends, patriotism remains a dirty word. You know, it's something that, you know, why on earth would you put Britain's interests before someone else's? For someone on the estate in uh, where, I, where I was campaigning, uh, that would be a nonsense. But for them, that, that's what it is. Um, similarly, um, they felt that a lot of liberals couldn't understand why they were critical of immigration, for example. Um, and for a lot of the people that I was speaking to in Southampton, uh, the country... Uh, they viewed as a home was being viewed as liberals like a shop. It's the best analogy I can think of in that case. So a liberal might think it's fantastic that our country is really open. That means there are more customers. That means there are more people doing business with us. That means we get to more, meet more people. Isn't that wonderful? Uh, but for someone who views the country not like a shop but like a home with all the emotional attachments that entails, having so many people being able to walk in and out without any sense of control uh, is maybe a little bit more frightening and maybe a little bit more threatening to the concept of, of a home and an emotional place. Similarly, um, uh, a liberal can, I think, end up uh, walking far too far down a completely blanket free market path. And it was interesting what you said, Nick, about you know, the rise of Airbnb and Uber. And we can debate about the merits of those individual things, and there's no doubt there's brought, they brought a lot of great things to probably people in this room and beyond. But they can't be replacements to that sense of uh, practical, face-to-face, -face, concrete community that these people are living with. And for, for a lot of places in Southampton like that, you know, the decline in the um, industry there in manufacturing and shipbuilding... Uh, can't just be then replaced with these new kind of liberal high-tech solutions that give them more consumer benefits uh, because their lives still feel like they lack meaning, like they lack belonging, like they lack purpose. And the answer surely has to be to regenerate those institutions as well as to provide new ones. Um, I think perhaps um, the biggest thing that uh, liberals without love fail to understand is um, that for many people change is n has not been 
a positive, productive thing in their lives. Uh, you know, if you, were, if you grew up a generation ago in Southampton, you would have been able to get a great apprenticeship, get a job in the docks, uh, raise enough money to look after your family, buy a house, uh, and, you know, live well. Not be a millionaire, but live well. And now, if you grow up in Western or those parts of Southampton, oh, you know, and I'm not talk talking about that, I'm talking about Southampton as representative of many places across the country, you, you can't do that in the way that you used to. Um, and maybe now what you're doing is you're working Costa Coffee on zero-hour contract uh, with no prospects of necessarily improving yourself in the way that you were. So I think liberals view change as progressive and always positive, whereas for a lot of those people uh, out there, preservation of and sanctity and loyalty and protection of some of those things you hold dear are really, really important. And so I just conclude by saying that uh, to, to really... Uh, to understand and to protect liberalism in the long run, we are going to need to do love better at the same time. Because just as liberalism pulls us apart, sometimes love can bring us back together. And until we understand that, the left won't regenerate in the way that it needs to, and liberalism is under threat. Now, guaranteed that I've now got Phil Ox's Love Me, I'm a Liberal stuck in my head for the rest of the debate, so thank you, Rowena. I, I'm just going to go a, um, straight out to the audience to see if you've got any points or questions. Uh, because this has been recorded, it's very important that you make sure you wait until the microphone comes to you and then you stand up. Um, you don't have to say who you are. I'll start, a, um, I'll start at the back there, because that's where the mic is. There's a kind of cluster of about three people, so um, yeah, yeah, just hand it. Hi, um, Jim. Uh, you mentioned that tolerance is often confused with indifference. I would say rather that it's confused with politeness or being nice or indeed love. Um, and this isn't what tolerance demands, is it? Liberals know this. Um, tolerance includes and involves sometimes very harsh argument, you know, vigorous argument, satire, things that might hurt people's feelings but not hurt them. Um, it's intolerant people who kill and censor those who they disagree with. So when we try to make laws that uh, you know, ban offensive speech, you know, things that might offend, let's say, Muslims or indeed Islamists, you're not protecting moderate Muslims at all, all the one, or tolerant Muslims. The only ones you're protecting are completely intolerant Muslims. Which brings me to Lucas's point. Um, he says, given, uh, <laughs> given the future potential that mass immigration could lead to democracy being the means by which Islamists could, let's say, potentially use democracy to overthrow liberal values, I'm really curious at your choice of examples that you chose to talk about Hungary instead of Turkey. And so finally, Oriana, um, communitarianism is not liberalism at all, <laughs> because liberalism gives primacy to the individual as a rational agent, not as someone whose role is shaped by obligations to family or community or church or religion. Um, and everyone knows that. Okay, do you want to pass it forward? So there's a couple of people. Yeah. Thanks. Um, yeah, really fantastic speeches. I really enjoyed each of them. I was very interested that uh, throughout each of your different speeches, there seems to be a key theme running uh, through each of them. So, Jim, you seem to uh, have tolerance as central to yours. Nick, you seem to have equality. Lukács, you seem to have democracy. And Rowena, you seem to have uh, communitarianism. So I just wondered, in terms of your uh, plan to revive 21st century liberalism, uh, can you argue for yours over the others? Why should yours prevail over the others? Do you want to pass it to there's a, someone at the end of that row? Uh, you know, I just have a very quick point, and I just wondered um, to what extent, if anybody thought that the, the kind of analogy between Brexit and a kind of reversal of liberalism is actually overdone, and whether or not really um, it, it's just, you know, it, it's not, it's a bit of a storm in a teacup, and I just wondered what, if anyone had any thoughts on that. Okay, yeah, and there's also someone else on that row. Yeah, um, take. Um, I, I was just wondering the, the opposition between liberalism and democracy. Um, I don't think it applies. If you say that democracy can be the tyranny of the majority, I think it's very important to point out that the tyranny of the majority is no more a democracy than the tyranny of one man. If you have the tyranny of a majority, then the minority who are part of the citizenry, part of the demos, are being treated as less equal than the citizens contained in the majority. H hence, democracy falls apart. The essence of democracy is like playing a game. Free individuals come together, like, let's say, 
a hundred of them come together, they wish to decide whether to leave the EU um, or any other kind of collective decision, and they say the only fair way to do this in a community of equals is to let the greater number of equals prevail. And then they agree at a certain date to make a decision and beforehand debate it, and then the winner wins. And that's not oppressive, that's just how you make decisions in a free society. So I don't get that at all. Good, but you didn't stand up, so you don't have to answer that question. <laughs> that, just, you know, there's also, there's someone else just behind you with the uh, person with the mic. Yeah. Then what I'll do is I'll let the panel come back with some responses, and then I'll go down to uh, um, yeah. some of the people at the front who have been patient. <coughs> yes, thanks a lot. Um, I, just, I guess I'm kind of going to pick up on the commut communitarian point to make a similar one, which is, <coughs> and I don't necess necessarily subscribe to this, but this is pretty much the main sort of criticism of liberalism is that it's a little bit passive, essentially, that there's no, uh, it assumes that everyone, I think it was said here, each person is a sort of rational agent able to maximise their own welfare, but it doesn't really talk about those, I guess, somebody who, or people who are less, who are more disadvantaged for whatever reason, who aren't really able to participate fully in the game, and I think that's probably the main or it seems to be the main sort of criticism of liberalism as, as sort of put forward classically by some of your, uh, some of the panellists. Thanks. Brilliant. Okay. Uh, James, do you want to...? Sure, yeah. Um, uh, lots that I could say, but I won't. Um, I, I, I think um, my response to the problem... I mean, I'm, I'm an ambivalent liberal in the sense that I think liberalism has some very good ideas and some very core uh, ethical principles, and then it also has some more problematic ideas. And I think one aspect where that's revealed is actually... Uh, in the context of liberal democracy, because insofar as by liberal democracy we mean a democracy which guarantees uh, a basic uh, rule of law and basic foundational rights as the condition of us all being able to coexist and work together, I think those things are very important. I think very often, though, what passes uh, in, the, in the, the current discussion and, and certainly in the academic discussion, we had some of this in, in the last debate on democracy uh, earlier today, um, is, is actually a, a very undemocratic liberal model which is premised upon the idea that actually people are not really very good at making decisions. They're not really very smart. They're, they're not really very uh, capable of, of making important decisions. And I think you can see that in terms of uh, things like the response to uh, Brexit, where clearly, uh, and this is the problem with, with a particular liberal mindset, the people made the wrong decision, didn't they? So, so, so they were given the opportunity to choose, and, and they misunderstood the complexity. So, so the liberal democratic model that, 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 that I think many people ascribe to is, well, if only, if only we'd taught them enough and told them enough about the complexity of the situations, they could have got the decision right. I think that's hugely problematic. So I, I think I just want to say there's, there's a tension there. And when it comes to the debate between liberalism and democracy, I, I think I'm a Democrat first and foremost who, who wants to instill certain liberal principles within there. I think that's also for me the, 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 the difficult tension with, um, with, with communitarianism because communitarianism has the potential to, to be hugely uh, coercive. That's its problem, isn't it? I, I, I agree with, with Rowena, and, and I think most of us would agree, that the society that we live in is, is, is problematically uh, atomistic and uh, alienated and individuated in, in, in lots of ways where we see communities that really don't come together. And, and I want those communities to come together. For me, the way in which those communities generate themselves is, is, not, by, is not by us recognising them as they are, but it's by actually having a society that can encourage people to come together and work through what it is that they want to do and what it is that they want to value. That's not a process that can come from the top. That's not really a process that we can facilitate through the state. On the contrary, that's a process that I think comes about through generating a culture of you know, a universal de desire for engagement, but also encouraging people to take a, a position in their life which is a bit more robust about uh, what they're capable of. So, so I think I would call in that... It, it, on Rena's concern, n not so much for love, I like love, that's Nick, but you know, um, not, not so much for love, but actually for democracy. <laughs> Thank you. That's two compliments today. Like but, 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 but the democratic engagement therefore becomes the important bit. Whether we end up loving each other, it might happen, might not, you know, but we're going to end up working together and forging communities together. Okay, Nick, is there anything you want to pick up? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, you know, one of the things I would say is that, um, it, it, to put this in kind of uh, contemporary political terms, what we're looking at, uh, certainly in the United States, and I suspect in England as well, and, and again, most of uh, Western Europe, or most of Europe, is that we have a political system that is very much liberal. We all believe that government should be limited. 
uh, that uh, you know, in that democracy, uh, 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 you know, contrary to what the uh, the audience member said, you can't have 51 percent out of a hundred uh, polity of a hundred people. You can't have 51 percent or 51 people say, okay, we're taking everything from the other 49, including their lives. Like well, you know, there are limits. Uh, to what we think of uh, as as proper government or as legitimate government, um, and that's a that's a liberal project that puts limits on democracy, uh, you know, as as was stated before. But what we're looking at here is the bankrupting, literally and figuratively, of large scale big government liberal programs in America. For instance, the you know the poor parts of the the country, the inner cities, they don't suffer from a lack of government attention. They don't suffer from a lack of government resources. What they suffer from consistently are institutions that force them to stay in a particular place that are incredibly uh, destructive to their lives. They have schools that spend more and more money each year that teach people less and less. Uh, they give them less abilities to actually fulfill their, uh, you know, their uh, their capacity, their capabilities. Uh, they they labor under all sorts of business regulations, all sorts of zoning codes, all sorts of coercive relationships that they can't get out of. Uh, and I think what I call for in a, in a kind of 21st century liberalism as libertarianism is not to say, okay, the state should be completely out of education, uh, you know, that we can make an argument for that, but rather that you give people more options that are closer to what they want because we need to, if we want to be serious and if we want to treat people with respect, which I think is a precondition for love, is to say, you know what, that a parent um, of, of an inner city school child actually has more understanding and more uh, kind of uh, the fierce urgency of now to say, I want my kid to be going to a school that will help them become a better person who will be able to get a job, who will be able to start a business that is different. And that goes, and I'm, I'm thinking I don't know anything really about England, but in the Rust Belt, I was on an earlier panel about this yesterday, um, you know, the, the talk about deindustrialization. America, and I suspect Britain is somewhat similar, uh, the percentage of people in the industrial economy in the United States as a percentage of the labor force peaked in 1943. I went to graduate school in Buffalo in the early 90s. Buffalo as a city peaked in population and in jobs and in economic power in 1950. Uh, people were still talking about, oh, you know, when, 10 years ago you could have a factory job there. It w wasn't really true and we need to give people the ability to move on and to morph into something different. Uh, and we need to do that by having the government do fewer things. We all recognize now you don't need the government to run an airline or to run a train or all sorts of things. The private sector will develop those, get the government out of that, and then allow for a more efficient, uh, you know, actual use of government pooled resources to help people become who they might be. Lucas, as a kind of traditional liberal, is this kind of Jacques, all of these uh, comments? Or? No, no, no. I'd like to, to reply to the, uh, despite the fact that you didn't stand up. <laughs> uh, well, that's, that's basically the point, that uh, liberalism puts limits on, on the kind of decisions you can take democratically, because Brexit is a, is a clear example. That the majority voted, you agreed on the procedure, uh, the decision is taken, uh, you should you should follow it. So whether I think it's a good or, or bad decision doesn't really matter. But there are more. There are there are obviously obvious limits to that. If, for example, those who won uh, this vote decided to. Uh, that the remainers should not be granted civic, civil rights anymore because they they have a different opinion. That would be uh, that would be going too far, even if the decision was taken uh, was taken democratically. And the same goes. Uh, obviously, there are uh, very examples of uh, many situations in, in in which it is contestable. For example, last uh, only recently, the Catalan referendum. Uh, is it, uh, is it, should you follow the democratic decision of the Catalan people or should you respect uh, the individual rights of all those people who voted against or uh, were not taken into consideration when the vote uh, was taken because they live in different parts of Spain? Uh, the same goes, for example, in the United States. Should uh, former prisoners be deprived of, the, of their civic rights? You can take this decision democratically. We agree that those people who spent, let's say, five or more years in jail should never regain their civil rights. Is it, it's a democratically taken decision, but is it right and is it, uh, is it in accordance with, with uh, liberal democracy? I would, say, I would say no. So 
I agree, uh, liberals, put, uh, liberals put limits on democracy. That causes tension because you always have to kind of negotiate which decision can, take, uh, can be taken democratically and maybe which should be uh, somehow you know, left aside because that would be going too far. One way of overcoming it is introducing qualified majorities, that some decisions should be taken by a, not, not plurality of the votes but clear majority or some super majority of the votes. So there is also always tension, but just to say let's be democratic and get rid of liberalism is, uh, is uh, in the long run uh, will cause more, more trouble uh, than, than bring benefits. That, that was my argument. Okay, Jim just wants to jump in some quickly there. No? I was just going to say, I mean, I, I, I think the best response to the tyranny of the majority is more debate, more engagement, more argument, more criticism. You, you hold the ideas of the majority to account through more democracy democracy and more discussion and more argument and more contestation and you try and win people over. Now I don't think that means we don't need a, a basic framework of, 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 of rights, I can go with that, but what I'm getting at is that I think at the moment our tendency is to move up, is to think that just because we've got a majority that we don't agree with, then that, that, that's the end point, isn't it? And actually the whole process of democratic engagement is one of making decisions and those decisions have to be made by a majority and yes actually by a majority of 50% plus a tiny bit and that's what a majority is. But then we, we, we keep on going with those debates and those arguments and those discussions, but we have made the decision on Brexit. Yeah. The people who didn't want, and, and I know that's not what you're saying, but the people who didn't want to go with Brexit can carry on campaigning. They have to carry on campaigning and making their argument, but they lost an important decision that's been made. That's I where, agree that, with that. That's where we what I would say to that majority. is, uh, What I would say to that is there are some decisions that are irreversible <laughs> and they irreversibly change your political system and you cannot really get back because once you deprive some people of the right to, to speak or, or to actually to, to uh, deprive them of political rights, you can't really take that back. So again, there is a tension. My point is, is as simple as that. When somebody is trying to sell you this narrative that there is this, some kind of different democracy, a liberal democracy, just don't buy it. There are, we, may, we may argue what, what should be the limits of, of the liberal protections uh, against uh, democratic de decisions, uh, what should be the extent of, of uh, protection to individual rights, but just don't buy this narrative that you just ca you, you can have illiberal democracy. In my mind, you, you can't. Okay, Rowena. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to thank the lady at the back because um, you're helping me clarify a really important point. So in my speech, I wasn't trying to say that liberalism is communitarianism. I was trying to say that liberalism uh, is nicely counterbalanced by a different positive force, which is love or communitarianism, however you might see that. And actually, you shouldn't have too much of one without the other. Both provide checks on the other becoming slightly out of hand. And what I would argue about our current society is that we have um, a massive surplus of liberalism, liberalism compared to love, compared to communitarianism. There is very little space in our political life at the moment for the values of faith or family or flag. Um, and actually, um, when I say those words, sometimes in a very liberal audience, they can sound like nasty or negative or perhaps dangerous words. And the problem is that when we see those words as something negative, um, another group like UKIP or like the BNP or like many far right groups in Europe step in and fill that space. They'll say, we can provide that communitarian uh, values for you. We can provide a home for these things that the mainstream is not providing. And then we get into a very dangerous situation where liberalism is perhaps under threat because it hasn't understood those concerns. Um, saying that is not saying that I think the state should run more things. Um, and if you uh, have a look <coughs> at Blue Labour, you can talk about lots of ways in which the state can help organise things to facilitate uh, more community action. You can look at the massive history of mutuals or cooperatives or the third model of vocational education or apprenticeships to kind of see how you can be more participatory in your in your state. Uh, and it doesn't have to be a centralised form of engagement at all. Um, I uh, just want to finish off by just answering the gentleman at the back uh, by saying, you know, is this all overblown? Um, I don't think so. Um, you know, I think um, a lot of the time liberal values have for a long time really looked down on people who are, who are different. I think this speaks to James's point as well. Around Brexit, there was a joke, a joke going around in our staff room that um, people without a degree shouldn't be able to vote. Oh, they shouldn't be allowed to vote, should they? They're all ignorant. And... Um, 
And it made me think of something that Morris Glassman says, who's a great hero of mine, who said, uh, no, no one is more intolerant than the people who keep going on about tolerance. <laughs> Right? And, um, and I think there is, there is something to that. How liberal are we when we are looking at a Brexit voter or someone who voted for Trump? Do we, do we just dismiss them as irrational? Are we really just criticising their views or are we actually undermining them as people? And I think until we respect them truly as people, uh, we are in danger of undermining our very own liberalism that we claim to protect. Okay, so I'll go back out to the audience. So there's a couple of people at the front who have been very patient. Still remember to stand up. Yeah, um. Yes, one of the values of liberalism that you talked about uh, was that of rationality. Now, we know that it's fairly common for people to be irrational. So do you regard irrationality as a moral failing? If so, what does one do about it when one sees it? And if not, how is it logically possible for anything to be moral failing? Okay, yeah, I'm just passing next to you. Uh, hi. Um, so this is a strand on the crisis of political language, and I wondered if uh, any of you would like to comment on you know, the dreaded uh, liberal elite who are demonstrably illiberal, who hate free speech, who are intolerant, and who want to dictate uh, how people should live their lives. I wonder if you have, uh, that, that's my sort of first point. Second point is, uh, Lucas, um, you know, the, the sort of checks and balances that you're talking about make me really nervous. And um, because ultimately all of these checks are, are checks on the people. They are checks on our right to elect a government of our choosing, whether liberal or illiberal. And, you know, I, I wonder if that is that an expression of a lack of faith in the liberal project that, you know, people do often contrast it to democracy. Is that is there a belief that people can't be won over to liberalism, that, it, it, you know, it should just be an elite thing that should just be decided and in place constitutionally so the buggers out there can't fiddle with it too much? Yep. Okay, so, uh, okay, yeah, just pass it behind you and I'll come to you. Okay. Um, I used to belong to the Green Party. I was a reliable leaflet deliverer for the Green Party. Going to Green Party meetings was like going to a student political meeting. There was no great connection between you and the other people, but you thought you were doing a useful job. I left when uh, Caroline Lucas said, I want open borders <coughs> as soon as possible. I then joined UKIP. Joining UKIP, walking in there to the first meeting, surrounded by people who knew very little about all the things we've been discussing so far, I felt a warmth and a connection which I had not felt before. And if we agree that rationality is driven by emotion, my, decisions, my decision to join UKIP and to work for it has been right. Yeah, well, no one said the Battle of Ideas doesn't have a plural audience. It's uh, quite a journey. Um, there's, a, someone, there's a person kind of right at the back. A, uh, you, at the back you can go to it. And if you want to take it up to there's a kind of group of people in the middle who... who Hi. Um, yep. One of the themes of classical liberalism was actually the free market. And it was interesting that none of you focused on that aspect of liberalism at all. Interestingly, Nick started to mention the economy for the first time in part of his answer, and perhaps that's from an American perspective. Has that aspect of liberalism essentially been killed off? I mean, very few people today defend the free market at all. And indeed, the term neoliberalism is more or less spat out by most sort of commentators in the sense that this just reveals a kind of complete disdain for the free market. I, is that aspect of liberalism dead? Yeah. And, uh, and kind of alongside that, there is the, you know, particularly you know, in the UK election and around Europe, there is the anti kind of economic liberalism, but a kind of accept, wide acceptance of a kind of social liberalism. There's a kind of lot of agree agreements. So that's an interesting kind of distinction to try and pick apart. So there's yeah, some people in the middle who have got a, uh, been having their hands up. Yeah. Um, yes. Um, so is this on? Um, first of all, Wukash, as a follow Paul, actually a second generation Paul, uh, and I, uh, as someone who voted for Brexit, also actually as someone, a member of UKIP, um, and uh, Rowena, um, I mean, far right, um, with, with respect, I mean, if you're going to engage with people in your community in Southampton, Itchen, um, and in a non-patronising way, it's probably not useful to use those terms. Um, I, I do agree with actually a lot of the points you made, Rowena, because you were talking about communitarianism, and I agree with the panel, it needs to be <coughs> civic rather than state, it needs to be uh, organic uh, 
from the individual uh, rather than top down. There's an author called Robert Putnam, uh, who was an advisor to Bill Clinton in the 90s, who wrote a book about 15 years ago called Bowling Alone, and it was all about the demise of the bowling leagues uh, in the States and how civic uh, communitarianism, participation within groups, had declined. I actually think that that's, um, we've now seen a counterbalance to that with the rise of social media, with the rise of the internet, and actually people, uh, it's a lot easier now to, to, to come together and to, um, to sort of um, interact uh, both politically and socially. Um, but, um, Wokesh, I think it's very important to make this point. You, you cannot put restrictions on democracy and claim to be liberal by putting any kind of restrictions on democracy that is by its very nature illiberal. Right, and I need to make that point extremely strongly. Um, okay, can I, say, I want to try and make sure we get into Sure, kind of sure. So I, I just want to, uh, to wrap up. I, I, one other thing I wanted to say, um, the author Douglas Murray uh, made a very good point. Today, there are people who are somewheres and anywheres. The somewheres are the working class, the people for whom communities are extraordinarily important, uh, almost an extension of themselves. And there's the anywheres, the liberals, the sort of middle classes who think, well, my uh, as long as I can go and travel freely anywhere in Europe, that that's fine. Um, and I think that goes down to self-confidence and self-belief. It's the the traditional working classes who perhaps don't have that self-confidence who need it, who need those communities. And I think it's very important to reconnect liberalism with. Patriotism. Okay, that's my point. there we go. Can you pass it? There's a, someone in T-shirt, uh, Battle of Ideas T-shirt, just behind you, actually. Um, if you could uh, uh, do that, and then I'll, I'll take these two in there. Yeah, try and get you in as well. Um, so it was mentioned that liberalism requires tolerance. Um, however, as many people have argued, such as Karl Popper, um, tolerating the intolerant leads to the destruction of tolerance itself. And so considering that, um, how far do the panel think that liberal societies can afford to tolerate the intolerant? Okay, brilliant. Short and to the point. I like that. Yeah, there's a guy in blue who's been waiting uh, quite patiently just there, um, and then someone across the way, and then, yeah. The, well, yeah. When the four of you were speaking, I was thinking how I agreed with all of you, and then I thought, well, that can't be right. <laughs> And, and I've, I've just realised, actually, after hearing our Green Stroke UKIP speaker, why it is. Uh, I think it's because you were all speaking at, at quite an abstract level. And the problem always comes when you try and apply abstract principles to practical problems. And to me, that the solution to these problems is to have a proper balance between theory and practice. And that's why I agree very much with Jim, that actually democracy has always got to come first and you then inject that democracy with values and principles. Um, and I think one of the problems we have in society at the moment is that that mix between theory and practice is, is always out of step. I think with someone like Trump and also with UKIP, they're very good on practice. They, they go and talk to people. They know what people think and how they feel, but they don't have liberal theories to back them up. Whereas the prevailing discourse, which of course Trump and, and UKIP are reacting against, is very heavy on theory. I mean, it's not high theory. It's not particularly well thought out, but it's always informed with notions of vulnerability, multiculturalism, diversity, all of that bollocks. But, but, but it, is, it is a theory which no one feels able to challenge. And I think the way to do it is by having a proper mixture between theory and practice. Okay, and then, okay, and then I'll take the, the chap just there, the sort of next, yep, next uh, view. Then I'm going to come back to the panel for some kind of really lightning quick just sort of responses and some of those things, then go back out for the sort of final round um, and then... Uh, okay, uh, thank you. Like Rowena, that. you were talking about, I think, illiberal liberals when you were... You know, part of your critique was about illiberal liberals, and I completely agree with that. But one of the really exciting things that happened uh, in this country back in uh, the summer of 2016 was waking up, well, actually sitting there watching it all night long and watching the Brexit vote because people have been told by liberal liberals, you know, they have been poured upon them from every possible outlet how stupid you would be to vote for Brexit. And I didn't think they would do it. I thought, you know, it's going to be quite close, but they're not going to do it. And then bloody hell, they did. And that was the most exciting day I can remember, to, to go to work and to talk to other teachers who hated the decision, um, absolutely hated the decision, but have a debate and discussion about it. It was just marvellous. 
But then you've spoken about a lack of purpose in people's lives and a lack of sense of uh, how they can move forward. And I think that's perhaps one of the things that's missing from this debate. You've all touched on it in some way, but not taken it anywhere. And Nick, I was really interested in your comment about experiments in living in America. And I, I like that idea. I like that sort of met, let many flowers bloom. But in the context that we're talking about, is that really going to bring about the change that we need? Because actually people's lives are dominated non-stop, as you've said, by being told what to do and how to live their lives. So is experiments in living enough to rescue us from this situation? Okay, so just kind of very short, kind of quick responses so I can fit in another round. Just Marina? very briefly to that. Um, yeah, it reminds me of... Um, uh, the, the, the morning of the Brexit vote starting in our school, there was this rumour going around, uh, oh, miss, miss, they're never going to let Brexit go through, miss, they're never going to let Brexit go through. That's why you have to vote in pencil, miss, because uh, otherwise, they, you know, they're going to change the vote. And, um, and I remember thinking when that Brexit vote came through, I am so glad it was not a narrow remain, um, because actually what I think happened was that democracy ended up being a sufficient vent for people's genuine anger. And if we hadn't taken that anger off the pressure cooker through our democratic system, uh, I think in five years we could be electing a highly right-wing government. And in a sense, people realised that if they voted, they made a difference. And many people might be unhappy with that, but at least the democratic system was able to take that anger and channel it rather than forcing it underground or it coming back to haunt you in a much worse way later. Nick? Yeah, uh, uh, one thing is uh, Karl Popper, uh, the author of The uh, Open Society and Its Enemies, uh, was known by his students and colleagues. Uh, they referred to that book as The Open Society by one of its enemies uh, because he was quite a jerk and, and, uh, and intolerant in personal life. But uh, to talk about free markets and the, and the role of that and in experiments in living, this is where I think we need a rescission of the state. We already can't afford it. Uh, it, um, financing uh, current government through massive sustained debt. Uh, m virtually all economists agree that that slows down economic growth substantially. And what we've been seeing in the developed world over the past 15 or 20 years is exactly that. Whereas the United States is uh, has a national debt that is equal to more than 100 percent of its uh, of its annual GDP, we have struggled to get above one two percent in economic growth, which ends up eroding. Uh, standards of living over time um, for a variety of reasons and it freezes economic innovation in many ways not completely and this is where I'll go back to the question about the free market what we see in areas where uh, people are able to uh, innovate and and experiment we see a flourishing of free market activity that is leading to new jobs and economic revitalization in various parts of the country and so it's it's not a mistake that in states in the US like Florida and Texas which tend to be uh, have less restrictions on how long or how difficult it is to start a business, to staff a business, to permit a business, you see higher rates of economic growth and that's where people are moving. And in many ways in the United States it would be great if we actually paid for our government uh, or we limited our spending to what we raise in taxes. Um, and we uh, probably, if we gave everybody a voucher or, or unrestricted cash grants, so that if you're living in Buffalo, New York, you can take a you can take a bus and get a, an apartment in Florida or Texas, you'd be much better off than trying to endlessly reprime these economies, which just don't seem to be working whatsoever. Jim. Um, yeah, I mean, I think more experimentation is just always a good thing. I, I think the more freedom we have to experiment more in our lives, I, I think at the moment, certainly economically, with different models of, of economic development and, and business, I think that's great. I mean, I, I'm quite inspired by some of what Nick says. I, I'm probably not as optimistic that that's actually the direction that everything is going in. So I think more experimentation could be good. I, I think at the same time as you've got some of those kind of you know, kind of, I, I think of it as kind of Californian, you know, sort of, uh, mo do you know what I mean, model, the startup yeah. model, all that. You've got that going on. So you've got certain sectors of the economy where things are happening that might be quite interesting. I think you've also got what, what I, I think, my understanding when people talk about this, this problematic neoliberal system, my understanding of this neoliberal system is not that it's liberal, it's that it's profoundly uh, anti-liberal. Uh, I don't think it's particularly free uh, market. I, I, I think it's, it, it's a kind of structure of, uh, economic and social organization that is quite happy to keep muddling along 
uh, because nothing is putting it under pressure. I think it doesn't uh, develop very well. I don't think it develops uh, uh, particular, uh, particularly well at the, at the economic growth and development and the kind of things that could be liberating, potentially, about a more freer and, and experimental uh, economic system. And I think there's very little pressure on that. I think you can see what happens when pressure is put upon that system. And that's where I see something about Brexit. And, and I hate to be a conspiracy theorist, but they're never going to let it happen. It's not going to happen. I think somebody said earlier on today, I think somebody sa said earlier on today, we're, we're going to leave the EU in the form of not leaving the EU, and I think that's the reality. We're going to fudge the whole thing. So actually, they're not going to let it happen. And, th and that's where you see democracy being fundamentally undermined. Okay. Lucas? Yeah, I'd like to address uh, the, the questions that I got from, uh, from here that, and, and from over there, that when you uh, limit, try to limit the, the scope of what can be decided democratically, you cannot call yourself a liberal, and it's basically illiberal uh, position. Then let me throw it back to you. Would you ban Supreme Court? It's a highly undemocratic uh, institution, uh, which sometimes overrules uh, the will of the people. Many people may be in favor of restoring the death penalty, but the Supreme Court can say that, for uh, not in the United States, but in uh, any other countries, that it's against constitution. We should not change it. Constitution, again, a highly undemocratic uh, tool, because usually it's very difficult to change it, especially, for example, in the United States. Again, another uh, example from the United States. Let's say after the Civil War, if you followed the voice of the people in the South, they would restore slavery immediately. Should you allow to do it, or should you somehow limit their uh, ability to make that decision? That's, uh, I would say, you should, because it infringes upon uh, other people's rights. In his famous essay on liberty, John Stuart Mill says that the, the freedom of one man ends where the freedom of the other begins. So I, I, that's, that's, uh, that's my... Uh, position and I don't think that if you limit the, the scope of the decision that can be taken in a political system uh, that necessarily makes you not liberal and I understand that maybe we went too far this is another subject uh, into a kind of political correctness into what is uh, admissible to political debate and that caused a, a great deal of frustration which could have been which we we could see in the brexit referendum uh, but I would also argue, I'm not British, so maybe you'll take it as an offense, but you, you, you keep on saying that the, the, the elites uh, voted Remain or urged people to vote Remain. Well, 48% of the people voted Remain. It's a, it's a pretty big, a big political lead that you have here, I would say so. That, that's all. It's, it's no, no, don't put it in such, such a binary terms that it's political elite on the one side and the people on the other because there were pretty much, you know, this, the same uh, number of the people on the other side. Okay, there were just a couple of people who were very, very patient, so I'm going to let them get in very quickly. So there's a chap just in that kind of far corner and in the red shirt. You're going to have to be really quick because a fascist are coming in next and I don't want to argue uh, with them. Um, what are the yeah. panel's sources of hope for the future of liberalism? I can't believe it. And actually, there's a, there's a girl in the head, the headscarf, I think, just stay uh, Wait for the mic still. Um, you just mentioned John Stuart Mill and like, the whole harm principle, but when we're talking about like, rationality and irrationality, um, John Stuart Mill believed like, slaves and black people were barbaric, so they couldn't rationally come to the decision of like, you know, making a good decision. So... When do we actually consider like what makes a person rational without being discriminatory or like subjective? Brilliant. And if you could just pass the mic along to that guy with a yellow mic, you just pass it over. The main premise of, of liberalism is that of the individual rational agent, as you mentioned. So sometimes, although I believe every everybody in his own mind is rational and he makes sense, sometimes we make decisions which are against, are against ourselves and are harm, harmful to ourselves. So my question is, how does liberalism tackle the, a, a very challenging situation in which a critical mass of people, for whatever reason, make decisions that are bad for themselves, and therefore, as a society, as a whole, we, we, we take a harmful path? Okay, so I'm, yeah, I'm just going to ask you for some kind of just almost kind of one line or kind of very brief thoughts and kind of in reverse order to how you spoke. So, Rowena, would you like to... In answer to that question there, I think liberalism demands that we let people 
harm themselves to a certain degree. I mean, if people make a decision that you feel is the wrong one, you've got to let them learn from it, grow from it, and carry on. Even Nigel Farage said at the time of Brexit, there might be a big economic cost to pay, but it's worth it because we feel other things are important. Um, so you've, you've got to let people do that. Uh, in terms of sources of hope, um, I would say that um, when I go in and uh, to my classroom and see my kids and they ask really difficult questions, uh, I remain really hopeful about the future and of liberalism. Brilliant. Hey, uh, Lucas? Oh, right. Uh, well, uh, so, so I'll try to, to answer that question. Well, it, it's hard for me to defend uh, the racist views of the, of the people uh, who lived 200, 250 years ago. And uh, obviously you can say the same about founding fathers uh, in the United States who counted every black person as, as three-fifths of a, of, a, of a person. So uh, this is a matter from a, another discussion, whether you can disengage political views from, from the kind of... Uh, some political views from the others, which we now find uh, un unacceptable. So now what I think uh, is the dominant, obviously, position is that every adult person is, is rational, is cap capable of, of making their own uh, decisions, and uh, that's what we should stick to. It's, uh, it's uh, as simple as that. Whether we consider that rational or, or emotional doesn't really matter. Uh, people are also entitled to make emotional political decisions, and I, I presume they usually make emotional decisions as far as politics are concerned. Nick? Yeah, um, I'll, I'll talk about optimism. Uh, I am always uh, super optimistic in every part of my life, and I suspect everybody here that is not governed directly or heavily controlled indirectly by politics. Things continue to get better, more fair, more accessible, and more interesting. Uh, you know, my, my phone keeps getting better. My internet keeps getting better. The movies, the TV shows I can get, the videos I can make as a professional get better and better all of the time. My lifestyle, I've never been so free. My parents, grandparents came to America about 100 years ago. They had very little freedoms, either politically because they were immigrants, but, uh, you know, just economically and uh, just on a lived experience basis. I and my children have, uh, you know, are able to do all sorts of things, and that is a almost universal experience in the United States. So, for me, the optimism is looking in the places beyond politics, where people are able to actually come together in a true community, uh, uh, where it's a win-win, a, a kind of market-based uh, situation. And what we need to do is maximize the space where that type of volunteerism and cooperation can come together. And Jim. Um, I, just on Mill, I, Mill actually talked about the people who weren't capable of freedom uh, being uh, children and barbarians. Um, you might think he's a bit of a 19th century elitist, because he was, but the interesting thing about both the children and barbarians is he thought they were all potentially capable of freedom. It's just that under certain social conditions, they couldn't live freely. He didn't say anything about black people or, or indeed about slaves. His point was about the nature of social organisation and whether that made freedom possible. Um, I, maybe I'll just end with, with Mill in terms of my moment of optimism. Uh, Mill's kind of criteria about harm, I think, is, is really interesting because he, he wants us not to harm each other and, 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 and then people often say, well, he doesn't tell us what harm is. But actually he does, he's very clear. He says harm is, is, is harm to the permanent interests of mankind as a progressive being. And I think that's an aspect of, of, of liberalism that I think is, is hugely important. That notion of mankind as a progressive being, that notion of all of us as being capable of transforming ourselves and taking ourselves forward, and that actually the limits that we want to impose upon each other are as thin as those limits which prevent us preventing that possibility of social development and further social engagement with each other. Excellent. Can we thank the panel? Uh, thank you. Um, thank you. Nice to yes. Thanks to Time to Talk for supporting um, these discussions and for our volunteers who have put up with me overrunning and causing all kinds of chaos. Um, stay in here uh, if you want to discuss what is fascism. Um, there are still <laughs> sessions going on.